We're moving quite quickly through the center part of it. We're going to read and study tonight chapter 14. Chapter 14. Last book in the Bible. If any of you would like a Bible to follow it, there are Bibles available. Just raise your hand. We'll see that you get one. Just a moment. There's one needed there. Any others needed? One down here, please. Thank you. Revelation chapter 14. Then I looked, and lo, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him a hundred and forty-four thousand who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the sound of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpers playing on their harps. And they sing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are chaste. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb. And in their mouth no lie was found, for they are spotless. Then I saw another angel flying in mid heaven with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of water. Another angel, a second, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, she who made all nations drink the wine of her impure passion. And another angel, a third, followed, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also shall drink the wine of God's wrath, poured unmixed into the cup of his anger, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up for ever and ever. And they have no rest, day or night, these worshippers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord henceforth. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. Then I looked, and lo, a white cloud, and seated on the cloud, one like a son of man with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, calling with a loud voice to him who sat upon the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So he who sat upon the cloud swung his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle, then another angel came out from the altar, the angel who has power over fire, and he called with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, Put in your sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle on the earth and gathered the vintage of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city, and blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia. That's about 184 miles. Revelation is there in the Bible to tell us how the world is going to end. 
and what lies beyond the end of the world. It's there to tell us accurately what future history will be like, the kind of events we can expect, some of them in our own lifetime, maybe all of them. Every Christian generation hopes that this will happen in his own lifetime so that the new heaven and the new earth can come. Well, now the picture it presents of the future is grim. And many of you have told me with what mixed feelings you've listened to these studies. You've found them interesting, and yet you've found them not offensive, but disturbing. Now, there are two things you can do with facts. You can either close your eyes to them. They're still there, of course, but you are happier because you're not looking at them. Or you can face them squarely and ask this question, why should God want to disturb us? Why didn't God leave us in ignorance about the terrible trends of future history? Why didn't he leave us happy as we were? Why did he put this book in the Bible? Or why is that wretched preacher taking it? There's plenty of other things in the Bible you could take that are far nicer. Why? Why should God want to disturb us so much by telling us such grim things about the future? The answer is he wants to get you ready. That's all. Far better that you should know the truth and be ready for it. And I find this, that wherever God disturbs me in the Bible by showing me the truth, he always adds comfort. This is typical of the Lord Jesus Christ. He warned his disciples that in the world they would have tribulation, which means big trouble. And then he immediately said, but cheer up, I have overcome the world. Now, this is so typical of our Lord Jesus that I'm convinced the book of Revelation, as it claims, comes direct from Jesus himself. He tells us the worst, and then he picks us up and says, cheer up, look at this. Now, chapter 12 and 13, we looked at this morning, they were grim. I know that. And for those of you who weren't here, I'm going to repeat it and summarize it because you need to know if we're going to look at chapter 14, I apologize to those who waded through it this morning, having to face it again, but I can do it in summary. In a word, we see towards the end of history a growing tension and conflict between the church and the world. But this conflict is due to a tension between the devil and Christ. A battle which is going on up in heaven but which spills over into the earthly sphere. And in chapter 13, we saw that at the end of history, Satan will switch his tactics from direct persecution, killing and putting more and more Christians in heaven as martyrs, to a subtle social pressure which is far more difficult to bear. And we saw that at the end of history, there will be one world government with one man dictating the lot and backed up by one world religion, headed up by some kind of archbishop or high priest who will persuade the people of the world to worship the ruler of the world as divine. And in this way, for the first time, there will truly be a United Nations and a united religion. Yet both will be of the devil and not of God. It is for this reason that Christians hesitate to work for world government or united religion. Well now, in this situation, in a computerized world in which everybody has to have a number, people will be tattooed with a number on either the hand or the forehead as is already being suggested by international authorities. And the number to be used is 666. When you hear that number being used on a world scale, you'll know that you are about to face this kind of pressure. The only people who will not accept the worship of a world dictator and who will not join in a world religion are the Christians the people of God. And they will refuse to do it because no man is divine and totalitarian states are not God's will. And therefore we were told that they would not be allowed to buy or sell, 
to be employed, to do anything. In other words, instead of being thrown to the lions, you are just thrown out of the employment exchange and the supermarket. That is very much more difficult because it means that normal life becomes impossible. It means you would only get anything from scraps thrown out. It means that you'd be around the dustbins looking for your next meal. And it means that you would see your own children starve. I remember visiting a little village. I won't tell you where because that would be unfair, not in this country. And the Christians there meeting in their little church told me this. There is only one school within reach of this village. And the authorities of the school will not let Christian children into it. Therefore our children grow up illiterate. We cannot teach them because we never learned how to read and write. And we see all the other children in the neighborhood learning how to be educated, how to get a job, how to climb the social ladder. And our children are going to be beggars for the rest of their lives. Yet they still went to church. Knowing how eagerly families in Surrey get their children into better and better schools, I wonder how many would be in this church if your children couldn't get any education because you're a Christian. That's the kind of pressure. And it's a terrible pressure. Now that is the forecasted prediction of the Word of God of the social situation in the last three and a half years of history. And it'll be tough. Now having told us the worst, Chapter 14 says, be of good cheer. Cheer up. There are many things on the other side that will help you to get a balanced view, not to panic, not to fear, but to face the future calmly and serenely. What are those things? Seven different visions or voices in chapter 14 give us seven facts about the future which you can put on the other scale on the other pan on the scales, to weigh up against the grim persecution that will come. What are these facts? The first is a glimpse of the martyrs who have died for their faith. A large number of them, 144,000 of them, who have been martyred during the time immediately preceding this last trouble. This is not the 144,000 of chapter 7, which clearly referred to Jews. These are Christians. And they are people who've died for their faith. And we catch a glimpse of them in heaven. Are they downhearted? Are they sad that their lives were cut short? No, they're singing their heads off. In other words, what we would count as a tragedy, they count as a triumph. What we would count as a terrible end, they see as the beginning. And the first vision that John has lying there in prison that Sunday morning is of a great number of people thrilled to be in heaven, almost thanking their persecutors for getting them there early. I wonder if we really feel like that. We tend to congratulate people on getting better from illness and coming back from the gates of death. I remember Herbert Silverwood, that great evangelist who went uh, every year to the sands at Yarmouth to preach and at the end of one week he went in paddling. He couldn't swim and the beach shelves rather sharply there, as you probably know. And he got out of his depth and got into difficulties and shouted, help, help. And the lifeguard dashed in and pulled him out. And then the lifeguard said, you know, I don't understand you, Mr. Silverwood. You've been preaching all week about the joys of heaven. And the first chance you get to go there, you're yelling for somebody to pull you back. Herbert Silverwood is never at a loss for... A reply, and he looked down at his swimming trunks and said, ah, but I wanted to go decent. But it, um, <laughs> it was a challenge, he told me afterwards, to his own soul. We congratulate people who get better. But these martyrs are thrilled to be in glory. There are three things said about them that qualified them for this particular honor and for the honor of singing a special song composed for them by God and taught to them by the Spirit. The three things are chastity, loyalty, and integrity. 
Now don't get this wrong. They are not there because they remained single. The Bible never says that the single state is higher than the married state, nor does it say that the married state is higher than the single state. Some are called to one and some are called to the other. Jesus himself said some are called to be single for the sake of the kingdom. Some are called to be married too. So there's no distinction here between a higher and a lower level and we can't base that on the Bible wherever we do get it from. But these three qualities which are said to characterize these lives, the 144,000, are the opposite of social life as it will be to the end of history. When marriage will perhaps hardly exist as a relationship. When the family tie for life will be almost an unheard of thing. It's rapidly going now, of course. But toward the end of history, chastity outside marriage and fidelity inside it will be almost unheard of. But these are people who in spite of the trends, in spite of the popular fashion, remained pure and chaste. Secondly, they remained loyal. It says these followed Jesus wherever he went. It implies that there will be many who will come to a point where they will say, I was prepared to follow Jesus this far, but no further. I'm not going that way. It will cost me too much. But these had the loyalty that says, wherever you go, I will go. And the third thing was integrity. And in the world, at the end of history, truth will be one of the most rare virtues of all. I glanced again recently at George Orwell's 1984. Winston Graham working in the Ministry of Truth, twisting the papers, twisting books, twisting so that you didn't know what was true and what wasn't. Good is bad and black is white. This was his job, the ministry of truth in the totalitarian state. Where the government does not tell the truth, the people are not slow in following their example. And this is the kind of future I see in which you will not be able to trust people. I think one of the most disturbing things about friends that I found was this widespread assumption that the other chap is out to do you and you must look after yourself because nobody else will and you must expect him to try and well deceive you. And this is so even into the income tax and the legal world as I discovered from missionaries who had tried being honest in the legal world. It shattered me and yet if I'm going to face the facts can we point a finger over the channel? Well now, in a day when honesty is gone, these people had no lie in their mouth. In other words, here were a group of people who kept chastity, loyalty and integrity, such rare virtues that they were martyred, but they took those virtues with them. Now these are only the first fruits, which means the beginning of the harvest, and so John sees this vision, what a comfort. Here are people who hung on to those virtues when nobody else did. And there they are singing in glory. And the sound is like a waterfall, it's like a lot of harps. It doesn't say they had harps, it said it sounded like that. And if you can imagine a concert hall full of harps and the Niagara Falls in the background, you've got something like the sound of this new song. That's enough to cheer you up. Secondly, in verses 6 to 7, we have a vision of a flying preacher. Now, I can never read verse 6 without thinking of a friend of mine, Flight Lieutenant Murray Kendon. Some of you may have heard of him. During the war, Flight Lieutenant Murray Kendon was uh, on coastal work around Britain, and he had been out over the Atlantic, and he'd succeeded with his crew in destroying a German U-boat. And he was flying back. At first he was elated, ready to report the death of this submarine. And then he began to sober up. And he began to think, here am I, all the skill in my flying hands, and I'm using it to destroy and to kill. And then he thought, every air force in the world is designed with all its skill to do just this. 
Then he had a further thought, and he thought it was ridiculous at first. Why shouldn't we have an air force to do good? And he couldn't get rid of that idea. And when he was demobilized in 1945 or 6, he came to London and he prayed. He took a little office in London and he prayed for an aeroplane and he was given an aeroplane. And the very first time I ever flew in the air was in that little aeroplane. So it's a double thrill to me. Your first flight is always a thrill. But to be in that little aircraft. And from that one aircraft has grown an air force. You've heard of the Missionary Aviation Fellowship, haven't you? That was Murray Kendon's baby. And it all started because he saw this text. I saw an angel flying in mid-heaven with an eternal gospel to preach to those who are in the earth. And that text just said, you go right ahead and start an air force. And today, missionaries all over the world are benefiting from the airplanes Murray Kendon has prayed into his air force. Well, now, that's not really a very good exegesis of the text because it's about angels, but I couldn't resist that one. Well, now, what does the vision of 6 and 7 mean? It means quite simply this, that to the very last minute, God will give people an opportunity. To the very last trumpet, God will see that the gospel is still being preached. Even during these troubles, there will still be an opportunity for men to turn to God. And if men will not preach, then an angel will step in and preach. But the gospel is going to go out. Now, some people have a queer idea of the gospel. They think that the gospel is God is love and that's all. That's not the gospel of my Bible. The gospel of my Bible begins, fear God. You can love him then, but you fear him first. The eternal gospel the angel preaches begins, fear God. Unless you fear God, you won't seek forgiveness. Fear God and give him glory. Why? The angel says, if for nothing else, give him glory because he made everything that is. The sea and the earth and the sky, everybody can see these things. Even those who haven't heard the gospel have seen the sky. And they should know that it must require a great God to make all that. I have known people who came to a faith in God simply by going out on a starlit night and looking at the sky and gazing at it and thinking about it and just thinking of their creator. And so the angel is going to see that everybody gets a chance. The everlasting gospel will go on being preached even in all these troubles. Thirdly, he now sees a vision of something which is dismissed in one verse which we are going to study in detail in chapters 17 and 18 next Sunday evening. The fall of Babylon. That name is mentioned right at the beginning of the Bible, the Tower of Babel. It's the same name. There it is, Genesis 11. Man's pride and achievement and building up a tower that reaches to heaven. But Babylon here refers to one worldwide city. Now, I used to think this was the most incredible prediction of the book of Revelation, that one day everybody will be living in one city. But there are two things that make it believable now to me. First, that such is the drift from country to town that by the year 2000, 90% of the world's population will be in urban areas of over a quarter of a million inhabitants. 90%. That's the drift to the town. And the second thing is that already towns are becoming interlinked, not only by telephone, but by computer lines, so that increasingly it becomes possible to treat all the cities of the world as the suburbs of one city. And I can well imagine that within the foreseeable future, all the cities of the world will be under one city council will be treated as one city. And the name the Bible gives to that vast metropolis is Babylon, the proud achievement of men. It is a city that will have a terribly evil influence on the people who come to it. All cities do. Time and again, young people make for the city, hoping to find a good time there. And what happens? The city sucks them down into a vortex of evil and loneliness and temptation. You walk through Piccadilly Circus at 11 o'clock at night, any night of the week, just now, 
and you'll see what the city does to youth. Well now, this vision is of Babylon falling. Not just falling, but fall in. A city that has dragged young people down has vanished. It's gone. Cheer up. These vast urban areas are not going to last forever. They're going to go. Now the next thing he sees is something it's meant to cheer us up, but it's a very serious thing. Those who have drunk the wine of Babylon will drink the wine of God's anger. Those who exploited human weakness, those who built a vast immoral city for people to come to and spend their money, God's anger will be poured out. Those who worshipped the world's dictator and agreed to be tattooed with his mark, they too will come under God's anger. You know, I wish the Bible didn't have anything about hell. I wish that I could be the kind of preacher who kept off this subject. I wish I could cut these verses out and say, well, they don't agree with my view of Christ, so they can't be Christian, as many do. You'll find some of my critics in the Baptist Times doing just this and saying, well, it doesn't fit in with my idea of Christ, so it can't be God's word. I wish I could think that way, but I can't. Here in this short passage are phrases like this, fire and brimstone, torment forever and ever. I can't get round this. I wish I could. I wish I could tell you there is no suffering in the next life for others. I wish I could say there is no hell. You can all go home and forget about it. It was a Victorian way of frightening people to become Christians. But I cannot say it. It isn't the ramblings of a medieval priest. It's the revelation of our Lord Jesus. And we must face it. Verse 12 says that the only point in mentioning this is that it calls for the endurance of the saints. Since hell is real, don't identify with those who are going there. Since this is what they are working towards, don't climb on the bandwagon, don't get caught, don't get sucked into the stream. Endure it, even though it's going to be difficult. Keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. That covers your behavior and your belief. Hold on to both. The next vision, the fifth one, describes the blessedness of those who die in the Lord. And the meaning of that phrase is not those who were converted when they were 20 and died when they were 70. The meaning of that phrase, die in the Lord, is those who are still in the Lord when they die. In other words, those who've hung on those who've not given way to the pressures, those who when they come to die are right with God and in the Lord Jesus, they are blessed people. Why? Because they rest from their labors and their deeds follow them. Now I want to tell you what those two phrases mean. Again, I've heard this text read at funerals. It shouldn't really. It applies to the last days. It's a special beatitude, one of seven in the book of Revelation, and it's for those in the last days. But we must store it in our hearts in case we need it. To rest from your labors doesn't mean that heaven is a gigantic lounge. Don't know where people got the vision of a huge patio with deck chairs. You know this rest in peace idea? You're going to be working in heaven 24 hours a day. They serve him day and night in his holy temple. The word labors here doesn't mean work. It means precisely what it means in the maternity ward at St. Luke's. It means pain. It means travail. And blessed are those who are still in the Lord when they die because they're resting from their pain and suffering for the sake of the Lord and the gospel. And their deeds follow them means this, that you can take quite a lot with you when you go. You've heard people say you can't take it with you when you go. Don't believe it. You can't take your money with you, but you can take an awful lot with you. You can take a lot of luggage. You can send it on in advance and lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust corrupt and thieves don't break through and steal. But you can take a lot with you. When you leave this earth and make your journey to glory, you can take your deeds for Jesus with you. They'll follow you. They'll come on. 
And what you've done for the Lord will have eternal value and honor. Blessed are those who are still in the Lord when they die, who endure this suffering. The sixth vision and the seventh are both about harvests. This was a favorite metaphor of Jesus about the future. The parable of the wheat and the tares, the parable of the sower, the parable of the seed growing secretly. All these parables, he said, the world's history is like a harvest. The farmer sows the seed and then it grows and some other things grow as well, wheat and tares. They grow along together, slowly, surely, it seems a long time. And it seems as if nothing's happening in the field. You don't notice much difference each day. And then suddenly, the slow process leads to a sudden crisis and in comes the sickle. And in a matter of days, it's all gone. Now, having worked on a farm, I understand this picture so clearly. You keep looking at a field and nothing seems to be moving. It doesn't seem to be heading anywhere. And then you're aware that the heads are forming and then you're aware that they're beginning to go a bit yellow and then they go gold and they're ripe. You must get the sickle in. You must go in and reap it straight away now. The moment's come. And within a day or two, it's gone. People say, where is God? What is he doing? Can't see anything in the daily paper. It doesn't seem to be changing. The world seems to be going on. It isn't. There's a harvest coming. There's a process slowly coming and one day, suddenly, within a matter of days, it'll be gone. 1,260 days, I'm told here. That's not long. In comparison to the history of men, suddenly, it's gone. The harvest has come. The sickle is put in. The first picture is simply of wheat or corn being harvested. And at the same time, we know that tares are also burned. Jesus talked about this. And then the picture changes from the corn harvest to the grape harvest. And a vision comes of a great wine press. And the grapes are being thrown in. And the grapes seem in the vision to have human faces. And then the feet come and they trample. And the wine which looks so like blood flows. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. That phrase became the title of one of America's best novels, Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath. And he took that phrase and its meaning for that novel. But it's not a novel here. Steinbeck wrote fiction, but this is fact. And here we have the grapes of God's wrath and the blood of men of those who have spurned God and said, we don't want anything to do with God. We want a godless civilization. We don't want any churches in Babylon. We don't want any Christians here. And God will one day trample underfoot those who've said such things. I dwell no more on it. But I thought how appropriate it was that we had Holy Communion tonight. That wine in those cups represents blood. When Jesus prayed in Gethsemane, he said, Father, if it be possible, take this cup from me. <coughs> Earlier he had said to his disciples, Are you able to drink the cup that I have to drink? What is this cup? Throughout the Bible, the word cup is used of the wine of God's anger against wickedness. And when Jesus shrank from the cup in Gethsemane, he knew that God was saying, Will you drink my wrath against sin? And he didn't want to drink it. But finally he said, not what I will, but what you will. And he, he drank that cup. When he was put on the cross, they offered him another cup of wine. But the night before, he promised his disciples never to drink wine again until he drank it new in the kingdom. So he refused it. But he was drinking a cup of God's wine. We are able to drink that cup tonight because Jesus drank the cup of the wine of God's wrath against sin. And that cup becomes for us not a symbol of God's justice, as it was in Bible days, but a symbol of God's mercy. It is because he died that we can live. And it's because he faced this that we can join that happy throng and sing a new song around the throne of grace. Let us pray.
Holy Father, we're not holy enough to be angry about sin, but you are. We realize that those who have scorned your grace must face the consequences. We realize that when we leave this life and go into the next, our deeds do follow us. We realize with horror that the deeds of wicked men will follow them. But we thank you for the encouragement that all deeds done for the Lord Jesus follow his servants. Blessed are the dead henceforth who die in the Lord. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, for they rest from their labors and their deeds do follow them. We pray that if we should live to see these troubles, that what we have talked about tonight may hold us firm. And we pray too that in the lesser persecution which we may experience during this coming week, people laughing at us or people just avoiding us because we dare to go to church or say that we believe in you, we pray that you'll use these words to encourage us to endure and keep your commandments and the faith of Jesus. We ask it in his name. Amen.